keep an eye on where he was. Yeah. I heard him say that. Is that or would he even carry down for you? Yeah, so one thing when we talk, we're going to do a segment here tonight on, uh, on avalanche rescue as well. And one thing that we want to know is the last point seen. And the reason why we want to know the last point seen of where somebody gets caught, it's going to help you start to do your avalanche rescue scenario with your avalanche transceiver. And so that's why they said, like, keep an eye on him so we may know that he's, like, in the middle or on the side of that whole avalanche. So it's a good idea to keep an eye on him. Any, any other questions, you guys? Yeah. What are, other than other than a guy in a snowmobile like that, what's, what, what are other triggers? What, yeah. So what what are other kinds of triggers are out there? Well, me or you, right? Like the ski or the backcountry usually could be a trigger. Um, rapid snowfall is considered a trigger. Um, strong winds overnight. Also, like come springtime here in the Utah, what happens is we get really strong solar radiation and rapid warm up. So that's a that's a good trigger to think about. Um, explosives from a ski area. So anything that can actually initiate the avalanche is considered a trigger. Kind of endless possibilities. Somebody, yeah, cutting a cornice. Does everybody know what cornices are? Like the overhanging snow on the steep ridge line. So a cornice could be a trigger. So sometimes on the Avalanche Center website, they'll say, be aware of cornices falling, as those could trigger large avalanches. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, about five or six years ago in Cordova, Alaska, there were a couple guys who were uh, in the trees. Yeah. And they had their dogs with them. And um, it, they called the dogs down, or wherever the dogs were, and one of the dogs was on the top and created an avalanche, and one of the guys died. Oh, well, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty bad. And pretty sad accident. And they were wrapped around the trees, and they were in the trees, and it was a huge avalanche. Yeah, it's a pretty bad accident. Yeah? Good question. We ride, we ride snowmobiles, okay? I yeah. Get that. But how do you coexist with skiers, snow, you know, snowboarders? Because if you're riding a you ridge, and you're going to be weak, they're like five, six hundred pound machines. Yeah. And you drop the cornice. I mean, how do you how do you correlate with skiers? You know, yeah, so, and then you know, with our machines, I was like, yeah, we kind of do some crazy things. Like, I mean, I'll punch the cornices, you know. But on the same token, it's like I don't want to get other people killed. That's why I'm kind of like, you know, I mean, you travel, you travel on top, or you travel on the bottom. How yeah. do you keep other people safe? Because you know. That's actually a really, a really good point, especially here in the Wasatch, which is such a crowded mountain range. Oh. Is it? Is it, everybody aware of that? Like the Wasatch is, it's awesome. It's probably like the smallest, most heavily traveled mountain range besides like the Alps. <laughs> and one of the issues is is how we all coexist in the backcountry and correlate that to avalanches, right? And you can take one mentality, like the bro bra surfer mentality, like this is my terrain. If you're out there surfing in my way, I'm gonna come hit you, right? Or we can take the other side of that. Yeah, it doesn't work. So what we got to do is we got to communicate with each other. So if you're if somebody's below you and you're up on a ridge line, you know what? I just stay way away from the ridge line and I won't even come near taking a corn off because somebody's below me. I don't want to injure or hurt somebody, you know. And, and I see it here in the back you where people are down below and somebody's like, well, they're in my way. I'm just going to start cutting this corn. It's not get out of the way. It's like, no, we got we to all work together here and communicate. So when I'm out there back country skiing, I like to be like, hey, where are you, hey, Freddie, where are you going to go? And he's like, oh, I'm going to go over here. And I'm like, oh, cool, maybe me and my friends are going to go over on this side, you know? And snowmobiling, you know, I know it's a hard thing out there because you guys like to high mark up the slopes, right? You got like the skiers below you. So just try and make sure when you're doing that, that there's not maybe skiers right below you. Maybe that means you have to wait a couple minutes till they're out of the way, or maybe the skiers have to hurry up. But I think a lot of it comes down to just communication with each other. Yeah. Well, I just kind of curious on that because I don't know. It's like you 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 go down you go down in the valleys, okay. Yeah. You got the skiers. I'm like, okay. Well, where do they go? Well, you know they're going to charge up the hill. Then you you kind of go to the other side. But then on the same hill, you'd be on the other side. They could be on this side. You just still trip. You know. I just. I no. Know, it's kind of a. It's hard. Yeah, and that's one of the problems here. I didn't know if there's kind of a protocol or anything like that. I think the best thing is it's like a, the golden rule: treat people with how you want to be treated. So if you don't want somebody to ski right above you. And no one can to that. It's going to work for me in the back of the tree, so. Does that answer? I know it's, it's a tough question. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't help me, but uh, so. right, the way it is, All right, I'm going to, yeah, yeah, one more question. Yeah. So when you're in the resort, yeah. um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of avalanches that happen in the resort, too. So the triggers in the resort are the same, and they may not have. Uh, control them either. Correct, yeah. Because there's this false sense of security. 
Yeah, that's a tricky uh, question you're asking. Yeah. Um, so inside the resort, you know, uh, I think resorts do a phenomenal job of doing the best thing they can to, to mitigate an avalanche risk in their thing. But you know, when you, there's a, an assumption to risk when you go to a resort. And I recommend to people, if you have an avalanche beacon, you might as well use it in the resort because it doesn't cost you anything except batteries. So, but you know, it's a tough thing, you know. So I think uh, the, the resorts do a phenomenal job. And if you're, if you're skiing in the resort bounds that are open, then you're probably safe, you know. There are, uh, there are risks with, with skiing. So and there's only so much people can do, just like our risks with driving and stuff like that. So. I think the same rules should apply as far as skiing above somebody. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, for sure. You know, try and be courteous to people. More people get hurt, you know, at resorts because people collide with each other, skiing fast out of control than an avalanche. So I have a lecture on that someday too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass this on over to Freddie, and Freddie's going to talk a little bit about avalanche training. Okay, that's. This is going to be a little bit of a shock now with my accent. <laughs> Just coming back to that question to Jack too, some countries now, especially in Europe, you are responsible if you drop an avalanche, you kill someone, you go to court. Some countries even have um, new regulations. If you release an avalanche in the back country, you go to jail. So there's a lot of stuff going on with those avalanches because that is a problem all around, you know, people <coughs> dropping snow on other people. So if we can be really responsible about it, we don't have to go that far. And it's kind of ironic, you know, Europe is not so much into that suing um, trend, but they did that. Italy is very, very hard on it. So you have to take responsibility if you release an avalanche. Uh, so, if we do a good job, we don't have to go there, I hope. So, let's go see if I have this right. This is the triangle again. So, it gives us some clues what, what's out there. We're trying to collect all this information. This works. Okay. We're looking at avalanche terrain. An avalanche terrain is a little bit like real estate. It's location, location, location. It's also the easiest one if you're a beginner in the, in the backcountry to start. It, it's easy to get a hold on it, but it's also for me as a professional, I can really go with the terrain because terrain doesn't change on me. It's always the same. Uh, so terrain is really, really important. I work with the terrain so much. I work it, really work it. So this is something you really want to pay attention. Fingers are too big. So when you go out there and you have an objective, that might not work because actually the conditions, they determine where you go or where you don't go. Like this group here, you know, they're going out there and you can see the first guy going like, oh my God, when that went. They released it, they were triggered. Uh, so the conditions, they determined that. So the big question is, do I travel in avalanche terrain? You've got to ask yourself this question all the time. So I'm trying to help you here a little bit to recognize avalanche terrain so you know where you don't want to go or where you want to go. The first one, and sort of the easiest one is, is the angles. So you have a 30 to 45 degrees. That's usually the starting zones of slab avalanches. But when you ski a slope in a ski resort, what kind of slopes do you ski? Greens, blues, blacks? Blacks. Blacks are kind of easy, right? We have those gray skis, rockers, and all that. It makes it really easy. So we, we ski a lot of steep terrain. We go down here, 
So 35, 30 to 35 is a black diamond. You see the, the diamond there. Most people can ski that. Uh, but that's a... Avalanches run and start there. They can even go below that. So double black diamonds are 35 to 45. It's not even that steep, you know, if you think about it. Look at that slope angle. And 25, it's rare, but they can run into 25 degrees if it's a big avalanche, very unstable snowpack. Why do you think not so much 45 to 60? Usually it doesn't hold, it slides off, it slops off while it's snowing. So, it's moving, but it's never really going to build up. There's some climates that can happen, but around here, generally not. Uh, so we're really looking at the 30 to 45 degrees. That's really where those avalanches start. So how do I find out? I get myself a slope meter. I can measure it. Or you can have a cell phone. You get the app, so you can put the cell phone on that slope. And we go a little bit into preparation to planning. If you do a good job, you know where you're going, how steep that slope is. So you go out there from a safe distance trying to estimate those slopes and then you can go in there if it's safe to figure out how steep it is. So you actually get good at looking on the slope to see how steep it is. So you know when you go in 30 degrees, or you go in 35 or 40 degrees, because that's really tough. And I teach a lot of those courses for guides, and they have to be able to say how steep a slope is, and you go back in there and measure it. That's one of those questions to pass. You've got to know that. If the forecast says, you know, the avalanche danger is considerable 35 and over, you've got to know when you hit that 35 because otherwise he could be in trouble. So that's really, really important. So another indicator is avalanche path. That's not a, a run. That's not a, a ski resort, huh? So if you see that, guess what? Avalanche is run on a regular basis. So that's a good indicator you're in avalanche terrain. Like this, this is a run-out zone, so you see those trees missing some branches. That's a good indicator. Sometimes you can go across this, you just have to do it right. Or sometimes you don't go across this. But that's a clearing from an avalanche path. Like that. You know, that tree, not a very nice Christmas tree, unless you have a corner. <laughs> been running on a regular basis because it's not very tall and it's been hammering on it, losing its branches there. So, the question is, you need to know where to go or when not to go. If you have that, if you look on an avalanche forecast and they tell you don't go in a certain aspect on a certain slope angle. You know you don't have to go there, you don't want to go there, but you need to know where you are. That's really, really important. So there's also, we're going to look into terrain traps and certain features as well. Good. So we identify different terrain. This is alpine terrain. So if you go above tree line, it's called alpine. That requires quite a lot of experience because the avalanche path all of a sudden is not there, right? When you have flat light, it's really hard to estimate the slope you're going to enter or you're going you know, to ski down. So it's really tough. You don't have those clues necessarily. It takes a lot of experience to go in alpine terrain. So you, you see there, slides, they went down, there's 
little gullies in there. See that? Little ridge that comes over, rolls over. Those are all potential starting zones for avalanches. Or where they run. Like this picture here that's in uh, Alaska, it's huge terrain. There's a lot of places avalanches can go and an experienced eye can identify that. But if you're not so experienced, it's really difficult. Or just make you get in a wide app. Oof, that's going to be tough to navigate around all this. We actually have a saying, if it's considerable and you can't see, and you don't know 100% sure where you are, don't go. Because you're going to end up somewhere where you don't want to be. So this is a bit more of the Wasatch, that is in the Wasatch. We have a lot of trees, it's sort of undefined terrain. It has a lot of starting zones. So if you want to go into those slopes, it's really tough to get in there. You really have to be good to find a way in there, right? And that's very often where we ski when you have a little bit of a higher avalanche danger. But those avalanches can still run in there in small little pockets. So in the terrain, we have two significant features. It's convexity, it's over the wall. So there's a lot of tension. Think about it, you just ski on it with your ski. You're cutting that snow up, it's steep enough to slide. There's a lot of tension on it, right? But the concavity also, you can be in the flats, and that can travel there because there is a compression going on. So it's on either side. That's why sometimes when, let's say we have considerable, you're, you're just cruising around in the flats, and that can actually release an avalanche because of a convexity, and it travels all the way up there where it's steep enough to go. People actually quite often get caught standing on the flats, and it comes from, the, from above. So you always want to look in cavity, convexity, and in a slope, you have those features. You can have that a lot. You'll see some slides where that really shows. Like here, it has a little bit up there in the top, right? Right on the top, you see that? But that has more to it too, huh? So you have convexity, concavity, we talked about. But there's some more irregularities, like a rock. The snow is not homogeneous around it. I have a funny story. Once I, I helped for a movie, and this director asked me, can we ski this slope? I said, hmm, let me have a look. So I went down on a rope. I came around it, and I stepped on this rope. I stepped on it, and I was trying to pull my other foot on it, and it went nice and quiet. But I was on the rope, so nothing happened to me. And it was just because that irregularity in there. Now that's a good trigger point. So if there's a little bit of rock sticking out and so on, that could be one. And you see it on this picture really well. Also on under trees, you have that irregularity. The snow pack can be thin. That's a good trigger point. If you ski up on that, you can start sliding below you. You can see it up there too. There's some trees on the fracture line or right below a cliff, same thing. Or below a cornice. It doesn't have to be the cornice, but just a little bit below that. And you start cutting that through, that can grow. Huh? So those are six significant trigger points. That's going to follow you all the way through if you do avalanche education on the warning deck. That's what I look for as a guide. Are there trigger points in that slope? Do I need to push again? Yep. There we
So what was that trigger point? What do you think? Convex, yeah. It's also <coughs> steep, huh? <laughs> so it, it takes two here. It's steep enough to go. So this one here too. Can you see the trigger point? Somebody tell me. The cliff, irregularity, a little convexity too. That was a poor choice of line, really. Low uh, in, you know, low is so tension in length. And now you can see it in actually on that slope, there's a lot going on, isn't it? Same here, huh? So this is, you know, what we kind of see a lot here. Lots of trees, you feel safe, there's trees, but in those trees, you have all those little places where you can trigger an avalanche. Same here, huh? Trees, little convexities, concavities, rocks, irregularities. Then terrain traps. So terrain traps is anything like a gully. It can be a rock, it can be trees even, a cliff that you get swept over. So it doesn't need a lot to actually be buried. It doesn't take a lot of snow. And on this one here, the, I think it was the patrol, the head patrol, he died in here. He was speed cutting it. He started cutting a little low by himself, and he got buried four feet and never came out of life again. So on another note here with that ski cutting, ski cutting is for experts. You know, you've got to know where to cut, where it's going to go, otherwise you might be the one going, and you meant good, but you cut a little too low, and you're going with it. And so you've got to be really careful with that ski cutting. Consequences, huh? And that's for real, you know. People do die. It's actually, I feel it's, if we're getting better on that, it's depending on every year. People are more educated, there's more tools out there, but it still happens. The consequences are there. We don't want to be this person. But to rain traps. Yeah. 
What else? There's a little slide of corners that may be broke off. Yeah. The angle, that's what I'm looking for. It's over 30 degrees. Good. So you see a lot of things in there, huh? Very good. What do you see here? Sorry? Way over 30. Yeah, see? What else? Cornice, yeah. Yeah. So we basically had some wind loading going on. So we have lee loading on the other side. So the snow picks it up and puts it on the other side of the ridge. And cross loading, that would be if it's putting it over or across the slope. So this slide should show you lead and cross loading. So the aspect is really important. I haven't <coughs> talked about that. But if the winds are prevailing winds, the storms usually come in from the south or southwest. Where where is it gonna put the snow down? Northeast. Northeast, yeah. We're here on the crest and we have very often we have the avalanche danger is sitting more on our side of the crest up there. So you want to know the aspect as well. Where are you going? What do you think here? There's a terrain trap in there. It's huge, huh? Getting pushed into that going? That's not very nice. Well, let's look a little bit about weather. Weather can have a direct influence on avalanche danger. It has a direct or indirect effect. The direct effect here is snow. A lot of snow, a lot of weight. Uh, and usually the first day after a storm, that's the most dangerous time. And after that day, things start settling out a little bit and it gets safer. So also everybody wants to go out. I mean, we're all skiers and snowboarders or snowmobilers. That's where you want to go out. But that's usually the most delicate time to go out. So if you see a lot of snow like that, I actually took that picture on the hot route, and we were staying at that hut that day. And then we went out the next day. We were mucking around a little bit, did some beacon drills, and showed some knots and Grassroots view, and then we went back. <coughs> or this one here, when you go in that and it starts snowing like that, that's going to load up pretty quickly, and the avalanche danger can increase rapidly. Again, loading it up. Now you add wind to it, that's even quicker. Wind is the builder of avalanches. The wind, if it blows fast, it can transport a lot, a lot of snow, especially if the duration is long. Like we just had wind, remember? And if it blows 12, 24 hours, it has a longer time to move snow. So, that's an indicator on avalanche danger into the, into the terrain. That's a cross loading and that's a lee loading there. You see that really well. Temperature as well. If you go in the shopping mall, you buy ice cream and you drive around and talk to your friends, what's going to happen with your ice cream in a car? It's going to melt. Well, it's the same with snow. It's when it's above 32, it starts melting, separating, and it starts moving. So you want to look at the temperature. Solar radiation, Jonathan was talking about that, especially in spring. Start warming up during lunch time. That usually should be done. That's Miller time. That's over with, right? That's when you look up on a slope and look at your tracks and you're done. Especially on that facing slopes. You can also see it's kind of shiny. 
that shininess, that means sweet corn, that's definitely where you want to go early in the morning. And this where all those direct effects, you can find out on the Avalanche forecast. They tell you that. They give you the wind direction. You can find out how long it's been blowing. They tell you where the snow is being sitting. They tell you what aspect you shouldn't go to. You have all the information you need. And terrain again, you know, the angle. That's something they tell you too, that's really, really important. So, do you have any questions on this? Took a little longer than that. Do you guys have any questions for Freddie? Yeah. Can you give us some idea of a, a basic uh, steepness of some of the slopes around the Mine Canyons that we might be familiar with, like Dutchess or McDonald's or on the backside of there, is it called Bear Paw? Or? Well, the, or they change a lot, right? But Jonathan might be. What was the question? At, Sorry. At the bear, um, some of the steepness of some of the slopes we're familiar with, so we can get a picture of exactly what a 30 degree slope is. Yeah, so like. On the back side of Canyon, is there one called Bear Paw or Bear, bear, bear Trap? Yes. Bear Trap. And what's that? A good example, and you know, I, I don't know Bear Trap off the top of my head, but does everybody know where Square Top is? Uh -huh. You know, outside the canyons, right? Square Top? That's about 37 to 38 degrees. So that nice slope there. And if you saw a Square Top in the summer, you'd be like, whoa things primed in avalanche because it's just a huge rocks, smooth face. And so that's a good example, like where that avalanche was today. Paul, do you know, I think it was like 34 degrees? In Duchess. Duchess draw, it's like 34. I know, exactly I know yeah. bear trap. Because there's so many slopes you can go to. You yeah. know bear trap was? Roughly 30 degrees. Yeah, it's about 30, yeah. And yeah. There's a lot of different. A few little pockets yeah. in there. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. 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 yeah. You know, my recommendation for you is get a slope meter and go and measure it. Look on a map, and but you have to confirm it in the terrain. That's really important because the maps don't show you exactly. So you learn to go there and actually do it and estimate it. You know, there's a good little trick is you can go like this. This is 90 degrees. So that's about 30 about 45 so you can look from the side it's always easier to look on the slope from the side if you can looking at it frontally everything in the shade looks dark and steep and all that so if you can travel around it and look into it i think that's a good exercise is there a slope meter here now yeah one, one thing when i was going through the guide program and like freddie was my mentor is what he told me and i and i went out and i did this i bought a slope meter and then when i was skiing at the resort i would just take it out because I was way faster than everybody I'd ski with, of course, right? You guys are always faster than everybody ski with, right? And I take it out and I just measure all the angles at the resorts I was skiing at, and then I build my eye. So way then I was out there, I was like, oh, is it 30 degrees or is it 22 degrees? You know, I'm like, so then I train my eye over time. And that, that I think is the best way to do it, like what Freddie's saying, get one of those. Yeah. White Pine Touring and Jans both have them. Or on the app, I have or, that too. Or the app, if just you have it. Just lay it on, some compasses have it on it too. You, you just really have to go out and do it. It takes a while to really actually get. Most people always think, you know, oh, that's only 30 degrees, and they're at 40. You know, it's easy to overestimate it. Any other question? Yeah. Do you see a lot of avalanches? I'm not. I don't do backcountry, but I just feel like if you're in the trees, you're safer. I mean, how? You know, it's open to obviously in a uh, <clears throat> slide area. Um, well, it's, it's depending on what kind of trees they are. Larches, usually, they tend to be a little more open. Pine trees are a little better. Aspens are not necessarily that great. But we have a sort of a saying with needle trees if you can see the blue sky everywhere, that's not going to be safe. Okay. So it, it has to have a certain density to it. But it also means an avalanche can start higher up and run through those trees. So you've got to be careful with those trees. They can also be the trigger point if they're spread out far. And that's a big complexity, especially in the Wasatch. Avalanches happen in the trees, and they have to be fairly dense. So nothing happens in there. That answers yeah. your question. So the dancer. The denser, the better, yes. But it doesn't 
me and you can please say it. Seven or eight years ago, there was an avalanche in the middle of the night uh, over at uh, Scott's Bowl, and it actually took out a whole grove of evergreen trees that had been there forever. So Yeah, that can happen, you know. All of a sudden, you have more wind, you have more loading, and it just has more mass to go down. I mean, you saw those pictures with the avalanche path, right? There were a lot of trees in there before, right? It took them out. It, it's really depending. And there's always those freak events we can have. If you remember, a long time ago, we had a lot of wind, yeah. and it transported the wind way lower. And we had the accident up here in um, Empire Canyon, way down. Usually, nothing happens there. The snowshoe that got caught in it, that was trees, a little opening in there. So it can happen. That, that's the thing with avalanches. There's so much you never learn out there. I've been all my life in snow, and I haven't stopped learning. I always come across something new. So it, it doesn't stop. Yeah. I got a question. Okay. You can do everything right, but there's always that 1% you're going to get caught in. Great. You know, you're screwed. What's the, the best possible way of getting away from it? I mean, you're already in it, you know. So what's your, your outcome? Try and outrun it? It seems like the kinetic energy is going faster than you can actually move your body or even if you're your sled, you know. So you can, you, you know, because it looked like that guy was trying to outrun it. Problem is, it's the pace of it where he was trying to get his energy to go. He wasn't getting that energy. Would it would have been safer if he tried to traverse it and get through the trees? Or, I mean, even if you're a skier, what do you do? You know, what well, do you, well, it's a good question, question. yeah. We're going to actually go a little bit into it in strategies, exit strategies. But if you can ski out, you usually go dive money and try to go out. You don't try, you're not going to out ski it, straight line it. Yeah, but like if you traverse it like this, wouldn't yeah. you get caught into it where it's just. Yeah, you can not pull your tips down a little yeah. bit, but it's all depending. It's really depending. Where are you at? You know, is it. Are you low down? Is it coming on top of you? Are there big chunks? Is it moving fast? Is it steep? You know, steeper is faster. What kind of snow? So it's really depending. A lot of people think they can outski it. Good luck. I was going to say, that's to me the physics, the physics isn't there to do it. So I guess you would just go to the side. Go to the side if you can, but you have to know which side you're going, you know. You may be going the wrong side. That's difficult. You know? The snow would be where that picture too is in. Place to start out that That's the risk of take, you know, 